All right, everybody, it's Saturday, so that means that we're going to be talking about the reasons that we got Trump again. Now, we've been through the Democrats, and we talked extensively about Obama and reasons that he was able to contribute to the success of Trump. But now I'd like to take some time and talk about the Republicans that opposed Trump and tried to keep him out of the primary season as it was. We've already taken some time and talked about Scott Walker and how I believe that he helped Donald Trump both in the election season and the presidency. But today I'd like to take some time and talk about the rest of the Republican field, the other 16 people that opposed Donald Trump as he was coming into office and trying to debate his way to the top. Now I initially wanted to go through and rapid fire through each candidate and then I realized that there were 16 of them and that was going to take a very long time. So in the interest of time, I took all 16 candidates and moved them into five lists. Five reasons that collectively each one of the candidates fell out of favor with the American people and why they decided to suspend their campaigns as they were going along the campaign trail. So let's take some time and look at this now. The first list that I want to take a look at is the list of Republicans that were too much of the same. And these are Republicans who didn't learn their lessons during eight years of Obama. These are Republicans who have chosen to go on the hardline neocon line and just keep trying to keep the party exactly the same as it was through the 60s, through the 70s, through the 80s, through the 90s, and through today. This is a very hard avenue to go down in the Republican Party today. In 2008, the nation rejected the Republican Party that was in power at the time and put Obama into office, citing his message of hope and change. Between the war fatigue of the neocons and the finger-waggling of the far right, the Republican Party had gone too far and had fallen out of the favor of the people. Yes, all four of the men on this list made very good careers for themselves, citing the same of the same and being able to do so in a district that supported the same conservative values that came out of the 60s. But as far as a nation went, it was so hard to sell that that these people just fell out of favor because they thought that all they were going to do was go back and get another four years of George W. Bush and then turn around and have to elect a socialist again to counter him out. Now, these four people that I have on this list were Governor Rick Perry, Rick Santorum, Governor Chris Christie, and Governor Jeb Bush. Jeb Bush is on that list for obvious reasons. The next list that I want to talk about actually goes right along with the same direction as we talked about in the too much of the same list. And that is the excessively religious list. Now I'm not going to sit and argue that conservatives across America tend to be more religious than liberals across America. Liberals usually seem to fight for a non-religious standpoint in American politics and try to force the government to take religion out of absolutely everything that there is in the government. But as we said with the too much of the same, there is an extent that we can't sell the same religious values to every single conservative across America. And even though I don't really believe that these three men really came out and wanted to do that, I think that was the message that was perceived from these three men as they were going along their campaign trails. Most of them made their campaign announcements citing God and citing the fact that we needed to bring our country back into Judeo-Christian values, that we needed to go back to the Bible as law, and those are good things. I mean, all of our laws are based on the Ten Commandments, but, but when you start bringing religion into the conversation, you start to shut the people out that don't feel that they need to follow the religion. You start to shut the moderates out, and you start pushing them over to the Democrat side. Or in this case, you shut them out and you send them over to the side of a New York tycoon that talks like the middle of the country that's been divorced three times. The three men that are on this list are Mike Huckabee, Ben Carson, and Ted Cruz. I remember watching Ted Cruz's opening speech when he announced his candidacy, and I was living with my cousin, who was a very staunch conservative, but also an atheist, and I discussed the speech with him. He had missed the speech. 
And the first thing that he came out and said was, oh, well, that guy's doomed right from the start. Even the staunchest conservatives, even the staunchest neocon business guys know that religion isn't a winning issue among the American electorate today. Yes, it will draw some of the hardline Republicans into the fold, but for the most part it alienates moderates. Interestingly enough, the next group that I divided candidates into kind of falls along the lines back onto the neocons and onto the too much of the same category. It's interesting that three of the groups that I grouped candidates into really fell under that same neocon attitude. And that is the idea of non-unity in the party. Ever since Donald Trump first started talking about running for president in 2012 and being serious about it, there were people who said that he could never be president, that he didn't have the experience, that he didn't have the know-how, that he would never get through an electoral process. And that was even further demonstrated by the Republican field that came out that was mostly career politicians. While most of the Republican Party eventually did get on board the Trump train and decided that they wanted to support Trump after he was gaining more and more steam throughout the primaries, there were certain candidates who, throughout their primary careers, came out and said they could never support Trump, that they would leave the Republican Party if he got the nomination, that they would be done with everything. These people didn't want anything to do with any sort of change in Republican policy or politics. They wanted the same old, the same old. They wanted the group that I started talking about, the too much of the same group. These people went as far as saying that they may leave the Republican Party if Trump got elected, even though he had an absolutely resounding message among moderates, and he was able to reach across the aisle and take some of the union-working Democrats away from the socialist wing of the Democrat Party that had taken over by the time he had announced he was running for office. Many of the men on this list came out and said that they would vote Democrat, if Trump was nominated to be the party nominee of the Republican Party. I have no sympathy for the people that went that far. They got what they deserved coming through the primaries, but it was that non-unity that drove even more people into the Trump camp. I do hate to say it about some of the people that have supported the values that I support in years recent. But this whole my way or the highway attitude that came through the Republican Party throughout the 2016 election cycle almost fragmented the party again and almost handed the country over to the socialist wing, the wing that so many conservatives are trying to fight against right now. Can you imagine what would have happened if that fracturing would have put Hillary into office, or Bernie, or put a blue wave throughout the House and the Senate? Think about the way that our country would be right now if that had happened. And then think about people like Bobby Jindal and George Pataki and Lindsey Graham. Think about people like Harley Fiorina, who I initially supported going into the primaries because before I started learning more about her history with HP, I thought that she would be a good addition for many of the same reasons that I wanted Trump to get in. Think back about Jeb, for that matter that too much of the same and my way or the highway attitude really rooted around him because everybody expected in 2015 that he was going to be the nomination. Hell, everybody expected in 2012 that he was going to be the nominee for the Republican Party. And of course, Marco Rubio and John Kasich were just as adamant about this. John Kasich held out almost to the end of the primary season with almost no delegates going in because he felt that he had to stop the country from going over to Trump at all costs, even though he didn't have a prayer of winning the nomination just based on the way that the Republican policy was written. But yet he fought on because it was the old way or it was no way. The last definitive group that I want to talk about is the group of people that just had an absolutely weak showing throughout the primaries. Now, there were pundits out there and journalists who took the time and talked to everybody who got onto the field eventually. 
Sean Hannity to this day goes out and tells his audience that he gave every candidate throughout the field of 17 equal airtime on his show to discuss their issues and discuss their platforms. But as far as the majority of the media went throughout the primary season, there were only a couple of names that got focused on. The couple of those names did wind up being on this list, but for the most part, there were a lot of candidates in the field of 17 that didn't get any airtime at all. Before I started researching for this video, I had almost completely forgotten who Jim Gilmore was. Did you remember who Jim Gilmore was before you watched this video? Do you remember now? In addition to airtime, there were just some people that were on the field that didn't have the best of ideas. There were people who were on the Republican field whose ideas just fell flat or just nobody wanted to see them be in office. Some of the men on this field fell into the situation where primary voters didn't think that these men could get any votes outside of a particular district one or the other anyway. When I was looking through the reasons for suspending the campaigns of these individual candidates, one of the things that I noticed going through all of them is most of them dropped out after they got a very unfavorable rating in a specific primary, especially if there were still many candidates involved. They placed on a double-digit place in a primary, or they placed second to last or last in a primary, and they just decided that they were going to be done with the whole situation. And that's a part of the thing with the free marketplace of ideas. The good ideas are going to rise to the top, and the bad ideas are going to sink to the bottom. These people went out and admirably marketed their ideas to the general public, and the general public bought the ideas with their votes. Most of the sources that I was able to find showed that the candidates who decided to drop out due to weak showing or couldn't stand up to Trump due to weak showing were Carly Fiorina, Rick Perry, John Kasich, who held on to the end even though he got the nomination from his own state and nobody else, Chris Christie, for very obvious reasons, Jim Gilmore, who I mentioned before, who nobody can even remember, and Jeb Bush, who nobody really wanted to see in office anyway, even though it was strongly assumed that he was going to be the next one in the Bush dynasty. A lot of this election came down to populism, and the most popular candidates were the ones that got the majority of the votes. Trump, obviously, Ted Cruz, and Dr. Ben Carson all showed very strong showings no matter what. But most of the rest of these people fell off the face of the earth for one reason or another, and it was usually the fact that they just couldn't get anybody to get behind them. There were two other candidates that I had to group into an other category including one who I haven't even mentioned yet in this entire video or my last video talking about the other Republican name, Scott Walker. And I'm of course talking about Rand Paul. I can't honestly tell you why Rand Paul decided to suspend his campaign, except for the fact that he may have seen something in Trump that the rest of us missed. Because there were a lot of people for whom Trump was not the first choice, but they still wound up voting for him because it was him or Hillary. Rand Paul had very promising numbers going through this election cycle, and he had very promising numbers going through the previous election cycle as well. There were a lot of people that wanted Rand to run and be president. And I can understand that Rand Paul is a good candidate. He's a great libertarian, and I think he would do great things for this country. And I continue to stand by that. The only thing that I can really speculate about Rand Paul is the fact that he may have seen a pattern forming and he may have seen what was coming again, just the way it happened in 2012. The popularity of Trump going along the campaign trail as he went from fringe candidate to serious candidate could not be mistaken. And I would not want to be the person who was shut out by his party for a second time because somebody seemed more popular to the National Committee. I think that would be a demoralizing blow, and I think that if somebody were to hold on 
for the entirety of the race being second banana and get shut out at the end again, I think that would take the wind out of someone's political sails completely. I think that would have ended Rand Paul's political career. So I think that he cut his losses and went back and decided to keep doing what it was that he was doing and fighting the good fight. And he did come out and support Trump as well. So he's been on the fence and he's been on and off with Trump policies throughout the Trump presidency. But I think Rand Paul made the right choice if that was the reason that he chose not to finish his campaign and see it through to the end. And in the other category, I wanted to take some time and talk a little bit more about Dr. Carson. Dr. Carson is another person who I was very stunned when I found out that he had suspended his candidacy. Dr. Carson had a lot of support among a lot of Republicans. He was even headed, he was a freshman politician, he was independently wealthy of his own volition. He would not have needed to take corporate money or any sort of bribe to get his agenda across. And he was just all around a good guy. In spite of every reason that I listed that the voters might have rejected him, Carson held on till almost the end of the campaign. Dr. Carson is a shining light to anybody who is in poverty in this country right now, white, black, or otherwise. Dr. Carson was able to pull himself out of poverty, out of one of the worst cases of poverty in the country. His mother made him read, even though I believe she was illiterate herself, and he drew a passion for education, and he drew a passion for science. And from what I understand, he is a brilliant neurosurgeon. He's never worked on my brain, so I can't attest to it from experience, but from what I have been told, he's very good at what he does. I'm very glad that Carson did come out and support Trump after he dropped out of the race, and I am really glad he's in the position that he's in right now, because he can start to shine a light to other people who have come out in a bad situation. I think he's doing very well with the position that he got, and I think it was very wise of our president to put him into that position. I know most people wanted to see him be the Surgeon General after he dropped out of the race and after it looked like Trump was going to win. But I think he's in a really good place right now in our government. He's another candidate who I can't really answer for why he dropped out specifically. I'd love to get him on my show and ask him. I'd love to talk to the man. I feel like there are hundreds of thousands of things I could learn from him. But as far as why he really dropped out of the campaign, I think is something that we would need to go and ask him directly, especially in the years that have passed since then. There's one final issue that I want to take some time and talk about. And I'm actually going to make another video down the road and talk about this a little bit more. But I want to take some time and talk a little bit more about Ted Cruz. Because Ted Cruz did make it almost all the way to the end and when Jeb Bush dropped out it was actually assumed that Cruz was going to take the nomination instead. But Ted Cruz had one last piece of controversy that was sitting over him that I don't think he could have got past. Ted Cruz was not born in the United States, and this has sparked numerous debates and decisions and court cases. There was finally a ruling that said definitively that a person does not have to be born specifically on U.S. soil in order to be considered for the presidency as a natural born citizen. And this is an argument that I made for a while. Ted Cruz's mother is an American citizen, a US citizen. Yet Cruz was born in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Under the birtherism discussion that surrounded Obama, that would have disqualified him for the presidency, even though I believe that the birtherism argument was a complete and total crock of bullshit because Barack Obama's mother was also a U.S. citizen. There's debate as to whether or not she renounced her citizenship, but she was a U.S. citizen. So, no matter where he was born, whether it be Hawaii, Chicago, or Kenya, Barack Obama was a natural-born U.S. citizen. But there were large amounts of controversy that surrounded Ted Cruz for a lot of the same reason. A lot of the people, when they found out that Cruz was born in Canada, 
decided that he was not going to be eligible for the presidency, and many of them were very loud about that. I go back to the conversation that I had with my cousin when Cruz announced his candidacy. And my cousin said the same thing. Oh, he was born in Canada. Doesn't that mean that he's not eligible? I do intend to make another video on birtherism and the eligibility for people to be president if they're born offshore. But I do want to make the small point that I know this wasn't the case with Obama or Cruz, but I know that the decision needed to be made for people born offshore because there are hundreds of babies that are born every year on military bases around the world to American citizen parents. These are people that I would never want to disqualify from holding any office in our country, especially the presidency. I'd want them to be able to aspire to the same things that their peers who were born here aspire to, especially since many of them live the later parts of their lives here in the U.S., and they are born American U.S. citizens. But that is an argument for another time. I close with this. All of the people that came out to run for the Republican primary were very talented people and politicians. The three freshman candidates held themselves very well and they were holding themselves against a field of people who have been in politics for years and have shaped the way that our country runs. This was not an easy fight for Trump, but once you go through and break down the candidates, it's easy to see why it was that he was able to make it through the field and ascend to the top of the country. What did you think about the Republican field going through the 2016 primary season? Who did you follow initially, and when did you get on board the Trump train? I always welcome a thoughtful and positive discussion in the comments section below, and especially over on Twitter, that is at Ed's blog Twitter with a one in place of the I. Thanks as always for listening to this show and supporting this channel. And remember, never take the words of bloggers, podcasters, or journalists as gospel. Find all the facts and draw your own conclusions. Take care, everyone. You're alone. You're alone.